If you read the stories in the last couple of weeks about Rio plus 20, uh, you might well have, have said it shouldn't have been plus 20, it was minus 20, and not much happened. I read a story, and one of the most memorable quotes said, it was total disaster. The only steps that were promoted and taken forward were incremental steps. Well, I am here to preach the religion of incrementalism. And I'm here to speak kindly of the ugly Bettys of the technology world. We all get fascinated, and we should, with the latest PV technology and many of the technologies that, that Brian talked about. Uh, but I, I guess I'm going to offer a point of view that comes from intensely focused work with China. Our energy uh, uh, pie in the US is growing at about 1% per year. China's demand is growing at 1% per month. So if you've heard that China's doing everything possible in renewables, absolutely true. Uh, but they're also building uh, a lot of new coal plants and hydro wherever they can. That's a lot harder in China. So we work together on these things that are perhaps not as sexy, but really, really important to the whole scheme of things. And let me give you a little bit of an overview not because U.S. and China are everything, but the math is pretty simple. Uh, the U.S. and China together consume half the energy on Earth, nearly half the energy and nearly half the greenhouse gases. In coal, we uh, combine consume 62% of the coal on Earth. That's two countries, 62%. So if you're going to start someplace, and coal, by the way, represents 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's something we have to focus on, even if we hate it, even if we don't want to deal with it. We have to, because there's a fact that people overlook that has become, I think, more and more important in our thinking. Nearly 2 billion people on Earth don't have electricity. We forget about them, and we want to have the latest, greatest, whatever. 2 billion people don't have electricity. They're, they're burning dung and wood in their huts. They're dying of various uh, respiratory ailments at, a, at an early age because of that. And it turns out that's one of the most uh, significant problems for short-term warming. The methanes and the other uh, gases that are emitted by that kind of burning are 50 to 100 times more dangerous for the environment than CO2. So they have immediate effects in terms of health. We have this issue of 2 billion people who don't even have a light to read at night. And uh, we've got to find some practical solutions, some cost-effective solutions while we do everything else. And I think we have to remember, perhaps we have the luxury in the US to chart our own future. This new natural gas phenomenon, which seems to be changing everything, and I hope it works out. I hope fracking is everything the industry says and nothing that the, the uh, opponents say. But it has changed the balance of, of power in the industry, where coal plants are now shifting uh, to natural gas. China is wildly seeking this because they don't have any natural gas to speak of. They've got pipelines coming into China. But it affects not only our two countries' energy policy, but worldwide geopolitical stability. If, and China clearly has a plan. You can see it all over the world, lining up resources, lining up strategic relationships. If gas turns out to be uh, uh, the magic elixir in this, uh, then that will drive a whole set of decisions that affect everything that Brian talked about. Um, but there's some questions about that. And um, there's some questions about my PowerPoint as well. <laughs> But uh, so Cornell did a study about three months ago in Science Magazine. It was published. And I don't know whether it's right, but it's really food for thought. Here's what they said. They said if you look at natural gas, they were looking at fracking particularly. If you look at natural gas from the mine, from the hole where they're uh, doing the fracking, all the way to the end use, 
you have to take into account the leakage of gas because that's essentially methane and that's 50 to 100 times worse, especially for the next 20 or 30 or 40 years of the short half-life that it has. Much, much more uh, impact on global warming in the next 30 or 40 years than the generalized CO2 emission rise. Uh, it's a big, big issue and they said from the, the escaping at the wells to the pipeline to all the little valves here and there, they believe there's something like six to seven percent loss in terms of natural gas system end to system end. Their calculation is if it's anything more than two percent loss, gas is actually dirtier than coal. Now, I'm not here to defend that or decide that, but I am saying in the public policy arena, we need some honest accounting before we make all these decisions. Uh, Brian talked about some, some great areas where we have real, real um, gridlock, uh, and that's in a policy sense. Uh, Brian talked about energy storage. Well, the real, we believe, we're working with China very closely on that. The real way to do it is to push it out to the edge of the grid, just exactly the way we architect the internet today. You, when you punch your uh, button and get a video from YouTube, it's not going all the way to uh, YouTube headquarters. It's distributed out to the edge of uh, the internet. Energy can be the same thing because it's not just replacing generation, it's also making the whole distribution system um, uh, more optimized and, and reducing line losses and taking wind, for example, which blows at night and making it useful in the daytime. Taking solar, which peaks midday, and making it useful at six o'clock to eight o'clock, which is really peak demand. Those are the things where distributed energy storage. And let me give you a story about sort of the cleverness that we see uh, and the speed of decision making we see in China. Uh, our neighbors uh, in Palo Alto, better place, uh, Shia Gassi and, and the whole crew, a great bunch of very, very smart people uh, four or five years ago came up with this radical new thought process of uh, to power electric vehicles with the battery. The radical thought process was really their business case. They would own the battery and then they would do this swap out station. You drive in, there's a machine under your car, swaps out the battery. Um, well, China, I mean, that, they're trying to do that. They're doing it in Israel, they're doing it in Denmark, and those small geographic companies or countries can accomplish that well. But you think about how many swap stations you would need in the United States to handle retail car traffic, and it's a big number, and it's hard to imagine. What China's doing in Tianjin, for example, a company we work with called Li Shan Battery Company, uh, China's leading lithium ion uh, battery company. They um, have a partnership with State Grid and the Tianjin uh, uh, Public Bus Authority. Tianjin's one of those many cities that most of us have never heard of, 12 million people, an hour and a half from Beijing, but very advanced. Wen Jiabao grew up in Tian Tianjin, so he has taken good care and it's really, they got a lot of eco-city things going on. They took the better place idea of swappable batteries and they're doing it for the city bus system. So what they can do is one centralized charging station which greatly simplifies the software aspect of how do you make this not negative on the grid. You don't want those things charging during peak time. That just adds to our problem. You want to use off peak power whether that's midday or nighttime power. Well if you have one centralized charging station, a swap out station, you can charge all those bus batteries at night and then use them in the day. Well, that's exactly what they're doing. By the end of this year, they will have 200 buses with the swap out technology. Within three years, they will have 7,000 buses in Tianjin. And that to me, they took a great idea and then they morphed it into their own situation using the 80-20 rule. They're gonna get tremendous impact, very high efficiency because they're doing it in one spot and they get most of the benefits without most of the cost. Uh, the other thing that's notable, State Grid is a gigantic organization. They serve 1.1 billion people 
They own all of the Beijing uh, utility, the Shanghai utility, all the city in northern China, all the city utilities are part of the state grid. State grid has decided they're going to own those batteries. So they're selling electricity now in a different form, in a different format, and they're making money through the financing of the powering of those batteries. And I think that's an intriguing new model. Uh, why don't I just talk? That's OK. Thank you. Thank you for your efforts. Oh, OK. Well, keep on going. We'll keep going so let me tell you a little bit about an effort that uh, I'm deeply involved in. And my colleague, uh, Wei Hibbon, is here with me. I'm, we're lucky enough to have the opportunity to go back and forth every month. Uh, most months, that's a great pleasure. Um, so what keeps us uh, totally focused uh, is the US-China Clean Energy Research Center. This was something set up in November of 2009 when President Obama visited Beijing. President Obama and President Hu said, we're going to put together the largest collective uh, in the world in clean energy research, fund it with private funds and public funds, Chinese funds and American funds. And we're now about two years into that effort. There are three areas of focus. Oh my gosh, thank you very much. There are three areas of focus in this um, center. Uh, advanced coal, and by the way, we say advanced, not clean. I think we need a little truth in packaging there. Uh, two, building efficiency, led by Lawrence Berkeley. Uh, and three, uh, clean vehicles, led by the University of Michigan and a lot of others. And through those, we have very, very deep contact. And the Chinese government, the leaders, uh, they revealed at the innovation dialogue with the White House in May that this is their highest priority uh, for collaboration. Uh, we've even negotiated a very uh, strict and understandable intellectual property agreement that governs this, which some said couldn't be done. But when you have, when you have the right political will, um, you, can, you can make great progress. Here's a, I'm going back now to the visual word. Here's a slide that hasn't gotten much attention, courtesy of our friends from McKinsey. I suspect most people at some point in your conference career have seen the McKinsey cost curve, which ranks the various technologies, positive or negative ROI and the impact. And that was a very useful tool in trying to chart a, a reasonable path to the future. Here's a slide that doesn't get much discussion. And the essence is, if you wait five years to implement what we know how to do, not the far-flung technologies, but the things that already make sense today, if you wait five years, you lose 53% of your ability to capture that incremental carbon. Five years. So whatever the technology, whatever the policy, I hope we can agree on a framework that says, Time is of the essence. And that gets back to the incrementalism. Uh, not a very sexy word. But there are a lot of 50% solutions, 80% solutions, 30% solutions. And I think we need to have a strong bias in favor of action to implement the things that already make sense instead of waiting for the magical 192 uh, country agreement on all things. That's a very complex thing to achieve. In the meantime, the, the clock is ticking, and we're losing the race. Here's a little bit more on coal. Just puts it into some kind of context of why this is important, why we have to do it. And this doesn't take into account those 2 billion people who don't have electricity. Um, a lot of people look at China, 1% a month growth even with all the investment they're making in clean energy and efficiency and all the rest, 1% a month. This is a, a chart done by Lawrence Berkeley uh, last year. And uh, I think it makes a very important point. What seems to be the case, China's going like this, 20 million people a year moving to cities. And I'll get back to that, because the city piece of this is very, very important. But they show a plateau in the mid 
2030s. So there's hope, I guess. If, if this is exactly right, I don't know. But China's trying to get it under control, but we have to understand the imperative of 20 million people moving to cities every year. They need roads, they need subways, they need hospitals, they need everything. That infrastructure takes energy, energy use is gonna rise. And behind China we have India, where 500 million people don't have electricity. We have Indonesia, we have Nigeria, which the UN projects is going from 155 million population today to 755 million in 2100. I mean, that's where the growth is gonna come. So all you can hope to do, in a sense, in the developing world is flatten that curve and get it to start coming down at a certain point. And China's doing a pretty damn good job of that. The, um, that led us to, uh, I mentioned this, and, oops, we missed something. Well, we've got a, I don't think it's, no, it's not gonna, there, there's, the, we don't have the right software to run it. Sorry about that. But let me, let me again emphasize this point. Wei, Wei and I and many others joined with Chinese leaders last month in Shanghai, in a new city in Shanghai called Lingang, which is brand new. You can watch it grow. Um, beautiful, gonna be uh, terrific in four or five years. They're trying to do it right. Uh, but this is happening all over uh, China. So we tried to figure a way, how can we freshen up this discussion of climate? Clearly, its peak has passed in terms of the political uh, world, not only in the US, but around the world. The recession had a big impact on that. How can we freshen up the topic? And what we decided, we looked at a lot of work that McKinsey had done again, Jonathan Wetzel, who was here last year, have done some fabulous work on urbanization. And the statistics are these. We're gonna see, in the next 20 years, the largest migration in the history of the world, by far. In all of these countries, China, and India, and Indonesia, and all the rest, uh, one billion people in the next 20 years are moving to cities. One billion people will need infrastructure, including energy. That's a big number. Take a smaller example. Bangladesh, Dhaka is perhaps one of the very poorest and neediest cities in the entire world, a population of seven or eight million now. 500,000 people a year are moving to Dhaka from the countryside in Bangladesh. So this is the trend, and we have a chance to do something. So my plea on smart cities is let's spend as much time on the basics, on the ugly betties of this thing, because we need a plan. I thought Jeff Heller did a fantastic job yesterday, and, and by the way, uh, the development he oversaw, the planning in Guangzhou is stunning. Uh, Guangzhou is not my favorite city in China by any measure, but this new part of Guangzhou by the Pearl River and the tower and what he's done with walkways and it's spectacular, so it shows things can change quite quickly. But his key point, I think, was it's planning, stupid. Um, so planning isn't about the latest, sexiest technology. Planning is about a thought process that brings it all together. Old style technologies like combined heat and power, or combined heat and cooling, can be just as important as the most, um, the latest edge technologies in solar or wind or ultra capacitors or anything else. Um, and I think we need to keep our focus there. Let's set the right regulatory things. Let's uh, uh, fund what already makes sense or get rid of the barriers to funding it. Uh, and we do have barriers. Uh, we had a good uh, chat with uh, Jeff Ball over breakfast. We have an institutional problem in the United States. We have 50 regulators of our electric utilities by charter, by legislation, their job is to serve their ratepayers. So in Virginia, it's Virginia ratepayers. What happens in Maryland, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and so on, 
doesn't matter. To the regulators, it can't because they're bound by that. But the facilities are built on a regional basis. Our air is shared by all. And what happens is we institutionally in the United States don't have a way to fund innovation for the electric power industry right now. If you always have to go after lease cost, if the benefits are only prescribed for a certain geographical area, even though the impact is much broader, we're shortchanging ourselves. And we just see such an imbalance between US and China. One of the reasons Duke Energy, a great company in my view, is spending so much time in China is not because they want to sell one thing to China. They're trying to implement things quickly. So let me close with a couple of examples uh, coming out of the US-China Clean Energy Research Center, which I hope will give you hope about this new incrementalism and what it can really mean. Um, it, it does me. One, there's a, a company, a small company called LP Amina, um, that has developed some really great technologies. Two of them, in fact, are part of our group. One is what they call a classifier. It essentially assures that uh, particles into a, uh, a furnace, a coal uh, boiler, are uniform in size. Not sexy, ugly Betty, right? But that improves combustion efficiency by 1%, and it uh, reduces nitrogen oxide, NOx emissions by 15%. Two year payback, there are 6,000 coal plants around the world that could benefit from that. 1% does not sound like a big number. 1% times 6,000 plants that represent 40% of greenhouse gases, that's a big deal. And it's cost effective in two years, but they piloted it in China and bring it to market everywhere. The second technology, is called polygeneration. I think everybody knows generation and cogeneration, where you take waste heat and do something else with it, make more electricity or distribute it for steam, for heating or industrial use. The third leg is polygeneration. And their technology on a retrofit coal plant basis takes 25% of the CO2 emissions from the plant and uses the carbon as a feedstock for petrochemicals. So you're doing two things. One, you're reducing carbon by 25%, big, big deal. Two, you're creating another revenue stream that makes that investment economically attractive because you have to have both. And we're piloting technologies like that. Uh, Duke Energy is working with Huanang. Huanang is the world's largest power producer. They have a couple of pretty stunning plants that do carbon capture. Um, and it appears that Huanang can do carbon capture for about US $35 a ton, $35. Everybody else in the world says it's $80, it's $90, it's whatever. So we're doing, Lawrence Livermore is uh, uh, leading this study, we're doing a real life modeling of Gibson, Indiana plant owned by Duke with their technology, their type of coal, their type of geology, and we're taking the Huanang technology and uh, applying it to see how the numbers will work out. We will know that within a couple of months. That's what Duke is interested in. Oh my God, if we can cut the cost of carbon capture to 35 bucks, a lot of things can change. Remember, it wasn't long ago, maybe two years ago, uh, Brian, help me, but it wasn't, uh, weren't uh, carbon credits in the 20 or 25 euro range at that point? So, I mean, so $35, 20 euros, <laughs> you start to see that some things are possible. Add in the 25% reduction, add in a 1% thing, and you can start to see an incremental solution to the puzzle. One final note, and then I'll leave and we can chat. One of the most memorable meetings I ever had in my life. I was lucky enough to meet through a friend, Gene Kranz, who you will remember, or maybe not, but Apollo 13, he was the mission control director for years and years and years at NASA, and the famous Apollo 13 where we had to slingshot the craft back, uh, back to Earth, and, and that succeeded. Um, so I got to meet him in Houston, and I said, you know, what happened? I remember President Kennedy saying we're gonna put 
A Man on the Moon by the End of the Decade, 1962 in Houston. I said, what happened to you early NASA guys? And he said, oh, we were just so thrilled. We were doing high fives and we're going to do this. And then we got back to the office and we said, oh, my Lord, this is impossible. I said, well, how did you attack that? And he said, we took the big impossible and we cut it up into a series of smaller impossible tasks. And then we'd knock those off one by one by one by one. Instead of being paralyzed by the big problem, they, they broke it up and tackled it. And I really think that's the perfect metaphor for what we need to be thinking about in climate, what we need to be thinking about in energy, and the solutions we already have and the technologies we already have can get us a long way, 60, 70, 80 percent of where we need to be. And then as the technology platforms develop on these other technologies, that can be layered in in a way that gets us to our goal. Change, lives. Change organizations. Change organizations. Change the world.